Okay, so now that we're done with studying periphera or sponges, we're going to move on to talking about the next phyla that we study in zoology, which would be cnidaria. So cnidaria, just like periphera, belong to the animal kingdom. This is just a different phylum that we study that belongs to the animal kingdom. Instead of periphera, it's cnidaria. And down here I have basically they are organisms that live in the water that sting you. So the first thing that comes to mind, you're probably thinking is jellyfish. You're not wrong. They're in here. That's actually the vast majority of them. Um, so jellyfish are a very ancient organism. They're the most primitive organism that we see uh, jellyfish in some other night area, with the exception of sponges. So let's talk about that. So cnidaria include hydra, jellyfish, sea anemones, and coral. Okay. So these are all animals. Uh, I've briefly mentioned Hydra before, and you guys answered some questions about Hydra in your protozoa lab, because that's the specimen that we normally look at. So we're going to talk about Hydra, jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. As far as their symmetry goes, if you remember back from chapter 9, these are radial symmetrical. Radial means that they can be divided uh, two or more times, but not an infinite number of times, like spherical, like we've talked about in chapter 9. The two basic body forms that we see in Nidaria, if you look down here, let me put this up here. If you look down here, are going to be polyps, which this is the sessile form. Remember, sessile, when we were talking about uh, sponges, means that they attach to a surface and don't move from there. So you have your sessile form, which is the polyp form. This is the more common one. It attaches to a base and doesn't move. And then there's the medusa form, which you think of the snake lady and the snakes in her hair. Uh, you can kind of see that here with the tentacles coming down, the flattened mouth down version of the polyp. So if you compare the two forms, they're actually kind of similar. If you guys look at the polyp form, imagine just flipping that inside out, right? And there you have the free moving motile or mobile medusa form. So here's another image to show you those different forms. You can see the polyp form here which is that sessile one, and you see the free-floating medusa form of Nidaria here. If we talk about the body plan and how this is arranged, they have an outer epidermal layer, just like we saw with periphera or sponges. On the inside now, they have what's called the gastrodermis or gastrovascular cavity. So it's not quite a stomach, but they have a cavity that's used to digest their food. They're not filter feeders like sponges are. They actually eat other organisms. So they have this inner ca gastrovascular cavity that they use to digest so for jellyfish. They would pull them through the mouth. Their prey would digest here for the polyp form through the mouth. Prey would digest down the gastrovascular cavity here. The middle layer, again, begins with an M, just like in sponges, how we called it the mesoderm. It's called the mesoglia, is the jelly-filled layer here. So they have epidermis, they have an endodermis, they have mesoglia. Unlike sponges, which are just clusters of cells, jellyfish actually do have tissues, but not quite organs. And all nidaria, for that matter. Nidaria have a specialized cell that they use to sting and um, hurt their prey called nidocytes. The C is silent here, nidocytes. So nidaria are all predators. They eat other organisms. Um, and they all have these nidocytes or these stinging cells which are in their tentacles. So on the polyp form, those nidocytes would be here. On the medusa form or the jellyfish, those nidocytes would be on the tentacles here. And the way it works is that they basically have batteries of these specialized cells. Uh, inside of these cells, they have this. It's a stinging capsule called nematocyst. They have tons of them, thousands of them, and thousands of nidocytes. Okay. And if you look, here is the actual nematocyst itself inside of the nidocyte. And the way it works is there's this hair trigger here. When it comes into contact with something, it sticks out like a harpoon. Okay. And that harpoon injects its prey full of a neurotoxin which disables the nervous system and then it will pull the still alive prey into its gastrovascular cavity to digest okay so 
you have the nitocytes, they contain the nematocysts. When they have this trigger uh, go off, it shoots the nematocysts like a poisonous harpoon or thread into the prey to poison it and to paralyze it so you can drag it still alive into its gastrovascular cavity through the mouth. This just shows you another uh, Nidaria Portuguese man of war. We zoom in on the tentacles, you see the nitocyte. Here's the trigger. Here's the poisonous harpooner nematocyst, which shoots out. As far as reproduction goes, when we're talking about nidaria, it can occur sexually through fertilization of sperm and egg. That forms a larva, which grows up to an adult. It could also occur through budding. This doesn't happen with the medusa form, but it happens with the polyp form. Hydra budding, it's an example that we used before. The three major classes, if we separate this further, so we have Cana Manamelia, we have Phyla Nidaria, and then afterwards we go on to the class. The three classes would be Hydrozoa, which are your hydras, Scyphozoa, which are your jellies or the jellyfish, and then Anthozoa, which include anemones and corals. If you want to talk about how these are different, we'll talk first about Hydrozoa. Hydrozoa, as far as the body plan, the polyp phase is dominant. So when you study hydrozoa or different organisms like hydra, they're going to be in that polyp form. They're not going to be in that free-floating medusa form. They're going to be in the sessile polyp form. They're generally going to be small or microscopic, and they're generally going to live in fresh water. We study Scyphozoa. This group is nicknamed the jellies because when you study this, this is the vast majority of your nidaria. This is all the different species of jellyfish that we talk about. So this grouping is very successful. In this, the medusa stage is dominant. So these are free floating or free moving swimming through the ocean uh, nidaria. They come in a vast variety of forms, but something that they have in common is these guys are all very aggressive. They're predators and they can be dangerous to humans. So don't mess with jellyfish or go near jellyfish because they do attack pretty much anything. They're not very nice. Last class will be Anthozoa. This includes your sea anemones as well as your coral, which you can see coral polyps here. Just like Hydra, the polyp form is dominant. These aren't free swimming or free moving. These are rooted or sessile into rocks or other terrain. They look like they're plants, but they're actually animals. Um, sea anemones do have those nitocytes that shoot out those nematocysts that we talked about. For poisoning their prey. You guys know about anemones because those are what clownfish use to hide in. They have that symbiotic relationship with them. Coral actually don't have those dangerous nitocytes like most nidaria. They actually have a symbiotic relationship with algae and they work together to build the massive coral reefs that you might have seen before. Okay, so coral have calcium shells for protection instead and they can build extensive masses, which can even form land masses and uh, host a lot of environments for organisms to live in the ocean, to be honest. So you look at some of those coral reefs and how massive it is, these are all animals, right? So it's pretty cool how much uh, land or terrain and places to live that coral actually provides for ocean dwellers, being an animal itself. And that's it for this, talking about Nidaria. So feel, I know I've talked kind of fast on some of this stuff. So feel free to go back and look over some of the slides that I've talked about.